Thanks to Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for sponsoring today's video. Before we begin, there will be spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach in the video to come. Of the most popular captains in Bleach, Toshiro Hitsugaya is perhaps the hardest to assess in regards to how powerful he's become by the end of the series. After all, Hitsugaya has a pretty hard time of it in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. He loses his Bankai, gets decimated by Basby, then finds himself turned into a zombie by Giselle. It's only at the very end of the arc that he displays some kind of real growth, finally revealing his completed Bankai at last. And while this new form of his definitely elevates him, putting Hitsugaya upon a pedestal of some kind, it's still difficult to tell exactly how strong the icy prodigy has become. Where does he rank among his contemporaries by the end of the story? As we roll into December, I thought it was fitting to take another look at the frosty captain of the 10th division, as we try to gauge just how strong he's become. In the fake Karakura Town arc, Kyoraku mused that Hitsugaya may surpass him within about a hundred years or so. Is his adult form a sign of things to come? How powerful exactly is that form, and how easily can Hitsugaya access it? As always, we'll use everything we see in the source material to try and form our final verdict, and decide where Hitsugaya now sits among the captain class. To begin, let's actually revisit my most recent ranking of the captains taken from the present day lineup we see in the Hell chapter. Having a look at where Hitsugaya ended up on the list will help form a baseline expectation for how powerful he should become throughout the Thousand Year Blood War arc, at least in my eyes. I don't bring this up to draw comparisons between Hitsugaya and other captains, that's strictly for those ranking videos, but to give an overall picture of how strong I think he roughly is. Hitsugaya is one of the few captains whose placement didn't change between my 2020 and 2023 rankings, and that's because I'm fairly content with where he sits overall. I've got Hitsugaya at 5th by the end of the series, sitting comfortably above most other captains in the Gote 13, but trailing just behind the biggest hitters like Kenpachi and Byakia to name a couple. And I personally think this is pretty fair. As I mentioned before, outside of a very last minute transformation, Hitsugaya doesn't demonstrate the same kind of explosive growth as some of these other characters, and less focus is put on his progress overall. He is, however, very reliable, very consistent as always, and one thing the Thousand Year Blood War arc does well is showcase Hitsugaya's potential, whether that's when holofied or zombified. I will throw in a caveat to Hitsugaya's placement in my ranking, however. While his battle against Gerard shows it takes him a long time for his Bankai to reach completion, to reach maturity, he needs to wait for all of his ice petals to shatter first, I think it's fair to say that once Hitsugaya is in his adult form, he could probably be bumped up a few places. It's difficult to say for certain as Hitsugaya isn't in this form for long and is against an enemy so incredibly broken that he doesn't get much of a chance to show off anyway, but I'd be happy, I think, placing adult Hitsugaya specifically at third overall on the list, displacing Byakia for now at least. If we take a look at Hitsugaya's trajectory, not just through the Thousand Year Blood War arc, but some earlier parts of the series as well, we can get a better idea of his overall strength by the end and how he got there. From as far back as the end of the Iran Kar arc, Hitsugaya has been actively trying to gain better control over his Bankai in an effort to become stronger. Although Hitsugaya claims to have successfully mastered his Bankai as of chapter 538, the Thousand Year Blood War arc resets the character somewhat, as Hitsugaya's Bankai is stolen from him during the first invasion. But unlike Byakia and Komomura, who each gain a new power as a result of losing their Bankai, Hitsugaya joins Soifon in simply trying to learn to fight without Bankai instead, and these two characters of the four, I would argue, definitely get the shorter end of the stick, and as a result, Hitsugaya is one of the captains quickly made an example of in the second invasion. Honestly, I am kind of surprised Hitsugaya wasn't given some kind of a more obvious, more tangible power-up. 
Both Byakia and Kenpachi have well-defined pathways to great power throughout the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Kenpachi in particular, and Hitsugaya is left to wallow somewhat, only being thrown a bone at the end of the story and admittedly out of nowhere as well. What's interesting about Hitsugaya's journey in the Thousand Year Blood War arc though is that at least in the early stages, it highlights the best aspects of him that aren't related to his raw power. We see his dedication in the way he returns to the academy to relearn the fundamentals of Zanjutsu, clearly believing he's relied on his Bankai for much too long, and there's definitely some truth in that. We see his maturity and how much he's grown since his complete breakdown in the battle against Aizen upon losing his Bankai, something that is intimately close to him and realising it isn't coming back anytime soon, Hitsugaya decides to press on rather than sulk, motivating himself to grow stronger in other ways, and this is absolutely commendable and the mindset that a captain should have. Unfortunately though, like I said, despite this, Hitsugaya is made an example of in the second invasion regardless. Despite showing impressive teamwork skills with Matsumoto, he is completely and utterly devastated by Basby, proving that Yes, no matter what, he does in fact need Bankai, and the skills and strategies he's honed during the brief intermission amount to, unfortunately, little more than gimmicks and parlour tricks in the face of Basby's strength and ferocity. Now, admittedly, Basby is, of course, very strong, and ultimately a genuinely really bad matchup for Hitsugaya, but it is eye-opening at how easily a captain is brought down. Admittedly, it was bound to be Hitsugaya's turn. Eventually, both Byakia and Kenpachi suffer similar fates in the first battle. And even then, as I mentioned in my battle analysis of Soifon vs BG9, she is taken down way faster than Hitsugaya is. But what's really interesting about Hitsugaya in the final arc is the way Kubo elects to show off the little captain's power in different ways. While he might not get a straightforward power-up until the end, after being defeated soundly by Basby, Hitsugaya rises again thanks to being hollow-fied by Kisuke and takes the fight to Kangdu instead. And now again, this one is hard to gauge. Kangdu's fighting abilities are barely seen, but as a Sternritter, he is at very least captain level, again, whatever that really means by this point in the story, and he defeated Matsumoto off screen without taking a hit, though if you ask me, my assumption is that he hit her with a sneak attack of some kind. However, Kangdu struggles to injure Hitsugaya at all, tossing the captain around with a few well-placed kicks, but Hitsugaya simply allows his Bankai to return to him before freezing the Sternritter with a single swing of his sword almost effortlessly. It's honestly one of the easiest victories Hitsugaya secures in the entire series. And as a result, this feels like one of the most perplexing moments in Hitsugaya's Thousand Year Blood War arc journey to me, with a lot of unanswered questions. Is Kangdu really that weak, or is Hitsugaya's hollow-fied Bankai really that strong? Or was the Sternritter simply too caught off guard by losing the Bankai, since we find out by the end of it all he wasn't really injured by Hitsugaya at all? And what kind of an effect did Hitsugaya's hollow Reiatsu have on Kangdu to help decide the outcome of the fight, if at all? We don't really know, and it is all over in basically a flash. Now, Hitsugaya's next fight is another strange but cool example of Kubo depicting him in a way we've never really seen before, and allowing the captain's true capabilities to come to the forefront, without really making him any stronger than he already is. When Hitsugaya is zombified and enslaved by Giselle, he finds himself totally unshackled. I've said it before, but I consider Hitsugaya to be probably the most morally good of the captains, and this shines through in the way he fights. But upon being zombified, he relinquishes 
all of that and turns into a cold-blooded killer of maximum efficiency. We finally get to see Hitsugaya fighting with everything he's got, let loose among soldiers who simply aren't as innately powerful, talented, nor as capable as him, and he swiftly overcomes both Ikaku and Yumichika, brutalising Ikaku without mercy before carving up Yumichika, before the fifth seat can even really work out what's happening. You see, it's interesting, both this fight and Hitsugaya's battle against Basby attempt to show a different side to the character, with this clash putting the emphasis on Hitsugaya's incredible swordplay and even some hand-to-hand -hand expertise as well, all the while continuing his trademark usage of ice in smart new ways. After taking out Charlotte with ease next, Hitsugaya duels Mayuri. And while any battle featuring Mayuri is always going to be a little dubious, at least in terms of their most straightforward fight, Hitsugaya dominates Mayuri, overpowering him in mere seconds when using his Bankai. Now, as I mentioned, it's hard to tell how well Hitsugaya is truly doing in a scenario completely engineered by the scientist, but still, it's an effective portrait of how the captain might fight were he totally unleashed. Before we continue with Hitsugaya's journey first, though, a message from the sponsor of today's video. All right, well, I've magically appeared in front of a Christmas tree with a Christmas jumper on and a rather festive looking box in hand to talk to you about today's sponsor, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. Unfortunately, Jade, my snacking partner in crime, is ill this time, so it's just going to be you and I tackling this testament to taste, but I think we can do it. So, as these are December's boxes, both of them are filled to the brim with festive and holiday-themed snacks designed to help you experience a piece of Christmas in Japan from the comfort of your own home. Now, while both Tokyo Treat and Sakurako contain an assortment of delicious snacks and Japanese-inspired treats, they each have their own theme and style to them to help differentiate the boxes. Tokyo Treat, for example, is a monthly pop Japanese snack subscription box that gets you up to 20 of the latest limited edition and seasonal snacks, and this month, Tokyo Treat's theme is Snacktacular Christmas. So, virtually everything you'll find in here has a Christmas twist to it, which is a lot of fun, and and some of the treats you'll find inside are Christmas cake gummies, a Christmas cockatoo donut, Christmas crunch mix, and a lot more. So I'm just trying to decide what I'm going to crack into here, and when it comes to me, there are two types of sweets, candy, whatever you want to call it, that I absolutely love. One being gummies, the other being chocolate. So there are a couple of great options here for me to dig into. So yeah, based on that, I think we've got to start with the Christmas cake gummies. I absolutely adore this little polar bear-like guy here. That's a big win, and the booklet says that they are layers of fluffy, chewy, strawberry marshmallow and tart strawberry jelly. So let's see what they're all about. Oh, that is very nice. <laughs> that, that smells really good and they look really nice as well. They are like little pizza slices or I think they are supposed to be Christmas cake. Yeah, see the problem I have is that I can eat, I could eat gummy sweets like this, like they're a bag of crisps or something. These are very, very nice and they do taste very much like strawberry. But next on the docket, we're going to try something a little bit different. We're going to change lanes a bit and go for the premium Ghana chocolate, which I'm very much looking forward to. That premium moniker has got me a little bit hyped for this, I'm not going to lie. Oh look, see it popped open in a very satisfying way, the chocolates are all individually wrapped. That is premium, I like that a lot, I'm very excited about this. See that looks really nice, my immediate first impression is it reminds me of like a millionaire shortbread, but it says here that they are a creamy, velvety chocolate square, so here we go. It's delicious, I'm a sucker for chocolate, absolutely love it. The Kit Kats this month as well, by the way, are like chocolate cake flavoured, so they'll be gone as well. But this is extremely nice. Yeah, very nice. It does have a premium feel to it as well. Meanwhile, Sakurako is a monthly authentic Japanese snack subscription box that supports local Japanese snack makers. Each box includes 20 traditional artisan Japanese snacks, as well as authentic Japanese tea, and even special Japanese tableware. This time we have a lovely indigo yuzen dish, which is really rather pretty. Honestly, the tableware is such a cool touch, and is one of my favourite things about the Sakurako box each month. But the theme this month for Sakurako is holidays in Hokkaido, which puts the focus on the beauty of winter in Hokkaido, which is the northern part of Japan. Snow covers everything, transforming Hokkaido into this stunning yet peaceful and inviting place. It's extraordinarily picturesque. Hitsugaya would absolutely approve of the blanket of snow. 
Some of the treats this time include a milk and chocolate cookie, milk mochi, and a Hokkaido butter cookie, all of which go excellently with matcha genmaicha tea. All right, so there are a few chocolate items in this box, but first up, we're gonna try the Hokkaido Adzuki cake, which is filled with red bean paste. Now, I didn't know I liked red bean paste until Tokyo Treat and Sakurako came into my life, but it has that sweet taste that I do absolutely adore. The pastry is a little flakier than I'd anticipated, but I do absolutely love the design on that. That is really awesome. Let's give it a taste. Okay, see, it says in the booklet that it's a delicate wafer. If I'd read that beforehand, I'd have known that this was gonna be flaky, but I love the red bean paste inside. It's so sweet and it is really tasty. Oh no, I'm getting covered in snow. It's clinging to the jumper. So I think the muscat fruit jelly actually looks really nice, but I'm gonna try the aforementioned Hokkaido butter cookie. Oh, okay, so you get two per pack. Now these are handcrafted by Showa Confectionery and apparently they are renowned for their rich and creamy quality. So we'll find out. Now it says here that they provide a truly exquisite cookie experience, which is a lofty ambition, but I have to say these are actually very, very nice. They do just kind of remind me of shortbread, which I love. And of course, no matter which box you choose, each one comes with a detailed booklet that tells you everything you need to know, not just about the snacks inside, but also about the theme of the month as well. I mean, I've been working with them long enough for now, but Tokyo Treat and Sakurako boxes are just a really fun, wholesome product that not only gives you the chance to experience Japanese snacks, but they also offer you the opportunity to learn a bit more about Japanese culture as well. But that's it for December's festive boxes. As always, I want to say a big thank you to Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for supporting the channel by sponsoring today's video. If you want to treat yourself to a box or celebrate the season of gifting by buying one for someone else, make sure to follow the links down in the description and the pinned comment and use my code for $5 off your purchase. Thanks everyone, and I hope you enjoy. And this brings us to Hitsugaya's final battle in the series, the all-out showdown against Gerard Valkyrie in Varvelt. Both Byakia and Kenpachi reveal something new in this fight, so it stands to reason that Kubo would have something up his sleeve for Hitsugaya as well. Hitsugaya spends most of the fight getting smacked around, but as I've mentioned in the past, Gerard is such an otherworldly behemoth of an enemy that it's really hard to quantify just how strong he is. Just because Hitsugaya can't stand up to him, doesn't really mean anything for the character in the grand scheme of things. And Hitsugaya is at least fairly impressive, staying in the battle alone for longer than even the combined might of the Vizards managed. Hitsugaya is also the only captain in this fight trying to juggle more than just the battle itself. Whenever a huge chunk of Varvelt is destroyed and threatens to hurtle down towards the Seireite, Hitsugaya takes it upon himself to freeze it back into place, producing an impressive amount of ice very quickly. As the battle nears its end, however, and it looks like the captains are out of options, the last of Daigoren Hyorinmaru's ice petals finally breaks. Now, pretty much since the beginning of the Iran car arc, I'd say, We've been led to believe that the ice petals of Hitsugaya's Bankai indicate a timer of sorts. As Hitsugaya remains in his Bankai for an extended period of time, the ice petals fracture and shatter, and the prevailing belief was that when the final petal fell, Hitsugaya's Bankai would probably disengage as well, to the point where we see Byakia also believes that to be true. However, as the final petal shatters for the first time in the series, Hitsugaya reveals that was never the case, supposedly, and he emerges from the icy mist in a new, older form. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. With Hitsugaya claiming he never said it was all over when the ice petals are totally gone, the implication is that he has always had access to this form, and the shattering of the petals actually always symbolised a countdown to the completion of Daigren Hyorinmaru, not its impending failure. But this does seem odd to me, and it makes it difficult to understand really if Hitsugaya received any kind of a power-up in the Thousand Year Blood War arc 
at all, or if he's accessing power he always had access to. But I think it makes way more sense to attribute this form to a direct result of Hitsugaya mastering his Bankai, as he mentioned he was trying to do at the end of the Arankar arc. It's just weird that his words to Byakia here, where he says, I don't ever recall saying that it was the end when the petals all broke, indicate that he's always had some access to this completed state and that our assumptions and his fellow characters' assumptions were wrong. Again, I mentioned earlier that in chapter 538, Hitsugaya claims he did manage to complete and master his Bankai after the battle with Aizen, turning it into a true Bankai in his words, presumably as a result of that training we see him undergoing in the cave. Before that, if Hitsugaya had lost all of his petals against, say, Shaolong, what would have happened? Well, interestingly, Kubo seems to walk back Hitsugaya's own words somewhat here in the Thousand Year Blood War, and reveals as part of his club outside Q&A question 226 that yes, if Daigurin Hyorinmaru's petals had vanished completely prior to Hitsugaya mastering his Bankai, so this is before the time skip, basically, then the captain would have instead been gravely injured by it rather than transforming. And that just works for me. That makes so much more sense to me. Shaolong's suspicions being correct makes a lot of sense. It's just kind of funny to me that Hitsugaya tells Byakia that he never said Daigurin Hyorinmaru would fail if the petals all fell, when that is exactly what would have happened, at least according to Kubo's retrospective thoughts, before the time skip, at least, anyway. Anyway, we're getting off on a tangent that could be a video for another time. Regardless of whether he became this strong in the Thousand Year Blood War arc or not, this is the first time we ever see Hitsugaya's adult form, his completed Bankai. The way this works is fairly simple, if unprecedented. By completing his Bankai, Hitsugaya is able to attain a level of power far greater than where he is currently at. So great, in fact, that his Zanpakuto doesn't think his present body and age, that of a child essentially, is capable of wielding it, so it forcefully ages him to the point where he can. I think I've probably mentioned this before, but this is essentially a vision of Hitsugaya's future. Presumably, when he is actually this age and looks like this all the time, he'll be able to wield this power all the time as well. As it stands currently, though, this strength is only temporary, and, crucially, takes a while to activate. Hitsugaya, Byakia, and Kenpachi aren't just some of the most popular captains in Bleach. They form a perfect trifecta of power, each one symbolising something else. Kenpachi is the ultimate paragon of raw, physical strength. Byakia is the ultimate all-rounder Shinigami, while Hitsugaya turns out to be the master of magic and frankly broken hacks abilities. And this only really came about after we saw his adult form, but it truly is broken. In this form though, the depiction of his powers are actually somewhat understated, despite how incredible they are, as Kubo flies through them quite quickly, but they are completely ridiculous. For starters, Hitsugaya is now able to flash freeze anything, and anything he does freeze has all of its powers and abilities totally nullified along with it. Gerard's Hofnung, which usually reflects the damage it receives back onto its enemy, is sliced effortlessly in two by Hitsugaya, but as he throws it on contact, the sword's abilities are all gone. It is now just that, a basic blade with no powers and no ability activates. This is crazy! And Hitsugaya doesn't even have to cut something to freeze it, he can simply hold out his hand or freeze anything that dares touch him. Not only that, but Hitsugaya's sole named special ability he demonstrates against Gerard Shikai Hyoketsu is also absolutely absurd, able to freeze all matter before him in just a few short seconds. Specifically, Shikai Hyoketsu completely freezes the four elements earth, fire, water, and wind within the space occupied by the opponent, rendering them totally unable to move. It is 
crazily powerful. On a level like virtually no other captain can reach, the sheer speed at which Hitsugaya flash freezes enemies and objects being the truly most powerful aspect of this form. Most ice-based abilities in Bleach, including Hitsugaya's own, often take a little while to freeze anything and often freeze the area around the enemy, entrapping them in an icy prison of sorts. However, what Hitsugaya can do here is instantly freeze the enemy themselves in the blink of an eye. And as we see when Gerard hurls his shield at Hitsugaya, the captain is capable of freezing not only the shield in mid-air, but also the trail of air behind it as well. Unfortunately for Hitsugaya, whatever power he has is undercut somewhat by Gerard, who bursts free of Shikai Hyoketsu in a mere panel or two. But against almost anyone else, this would be devastating and likely fight winning. And as we see later, Hitsugaya is able to freeze Gerard right down to the bone merely by being held by him, brand new wings sprouting as he finds himself in the Quincy's grip. Despite the very short showing we get of adult Hitsugaya, it is undeniably massively impressive, and the parallels are there, I think, between him and Yamamoto. Hitsugaya definitely has the makings of a future head captain, maybe not next up, maybe not even the one after that, but definitely at some point it is going to happen. And I like the idea that both Yamamoto and Hitsugaya are absolute all-encompassing, overbearing masters of their individual element. Yamamoto, of course, being in control of surging, all-engulfing flame, and Hitsugaya now being in control of incredible, immensely fast freezing ice. So, to take us back to the beginning, how strong has Hitsugaya become in the Thousand Year Blood War arc? The answer is that it's really hard to say. Unlike characters like Byakuya and Kenpachi, Hitsugaya doesn't get any kind of obvious boost, and Kubo is a lot more roundabout with this character than he is with, say, Kenpachi, for example. Hitsugaya remains consistently strong, however, yes, and Kubo gives him a multitude of opportunities to show what he can do in different unusual scenarios. But in terms of raw power, he feels much the same as he's ever been. While Hitsugaya himself seems to imply he's always had access to his adult form in some way or another, Kubo did clarify at a later date that yes, mastering his Bankai after the battle with Aizen was the key to achieving that newfound power, which not only makes a lot more sense to me, it also helps to flesh out Hitsugaya's actual developmental journey, getting him to where he is by the end of the series in a more organic way. So that's a nice bump for Hitsugaya in the post-time skip world, but the Thousand Year Blood War arc rewinds the character somewhat, forcing him to grow again and undergo trials and tribulations before getting a well-earned moment to shine at the very end. Honestly, Hitsugaya's extremely easy defeat of Kang Du feels like the biggest point of contention for me, but as I said, he's always been consistently strong. He's a little like Ichigo in that regard. It often feels like the two of them are pulling their punches, and Hitsugaya's ceiling is likely very high. That's why I'm happy keeping Hitsugaya where he is on my ranking. As of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, he's a very strong, very capable, and very consistent captain, resting nicely on the edge of the top five of the current Gotei 13. If he's able to last long enough in a fight to complete Daigurin Hyorin Maru, then I think he has the broken abilities necessary to rise up a few places again, but until he has a true grip on this new power, I don't foresee him necessarily being any higher, but I think that's only going to come with age. Here's a final point, though. Considering Hitsugaya manages to be this strong, mostly coasting on the same strength he's had since the epilogue of the Arankar arc, imagine if he'd been taken to the royal palace. All right, but that's it for the video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. How strong is Hitsugaya as of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, as of the end of the series, the Hell chapter, wherever you want to call it, how powerful has this captain become? Do you agree with my placement of Hitsugaya among the other Gotei 13 members? And what do you think of his journey throughout the Thousand Year Blood War arc as well? I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. As always, I want to end by giving a massive shout out and saying a huge thank you to my Patreon 
Patreon supporters. I really appreciate each and every one of you so very much. Thank you all for your constant support. If you like what I do here on the channel and you want to take that support from me another step further, you can go and support me on Patreon as well to get your name in the credits like this and to get every single video completely ad-free. All right, guys, well, that's it from me. And until next time, we'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.